All right, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Science Cafe, brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us here on YouTube for our program once again. I'm your host. My name is Chris Smith. I'm curator for the SECU Daily Planet Theater at the museum. And I'm here every Thursday night at seven o'clock right here on the museum's YouTube channel with all of you to learn something new. We've had a great time with our Virtual Science Cafe series, bringing in guests from all over to talk about exciting science happening out there in the world. And uh, if you're tuning in tonight and you wanted to get some of that exciting science from Dr. Zach Lohman from, uh, from West Virginia, we're talking about crayfishes. Unfortunately, Zach couldn't be with us for the program tonight, but don't you worry because we've got something that's just as good. In fact, uh, it turns out that for tonight's topic, it could not be more timely. See, the research curator for ornithology at the museum, so birds instead of things living in the water, uh, Dr. John Gerwin was able to join me tonight. And uh, John has been out there keeping an eye on chimney swifts that are now migrating through the triangle right now. John, welcome to the show. Thanks. I am going to go ahead and start the screen sharing. Sure thing. And John, you've actually been out like in some sites around the triangle observing chimney swifts even just this week, right? They are here and <clears throat> it's been it's an exciting month, September. In fact, here's a poster from a while ago. We did uh, we did a science program. Um, oh, I think we lost it. Is it is it not there? I don't see it right now. No, it looks like we had a try little again. something going on, but no worries. I'm going to try. Did it? I'm going to try it again. Let me know if it's. There we go. Perfect. All right. <clears throat> yeah, we did it. We did a program for it was a, it's essentially the, the precursor to Science Thursday or Science Cafe. Did a, a chimney swift program. So I am going to. Oh, my computer is being slow. There we go. Wanted to read a little, have you read a little quote here. So, um, yeah, it was in the late 1600s that a pair of swifts discovered a colony uh, or a, a colonist cabin in Maine. And it forever changed the relationship between this bird. It's a bird and people. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is the chimney swift and interactions with people and a little bit about the past, sort of a natural history and a cultural history. I've been doing a lot of this over the last 20 years with my colleagues at Wake Audubon and, and a colleague that uh, used to work at the Museum of Natural Science, which is John Connors. He helped start the Wake Audubon Society back in the 1970s. And uh, he and I have collaborated with you know folks at the museum and the rest of the Audubon membership to do a variety of uh, surveys and outreach programs to talk about chimney swifts. So I'm gonna give you information just about what they are and why we're interested. I'm, I like to start with just putting it in the context of you know, what is a, a swift and there's some recent genetic data. And if you look at the lower right, there's a little orange arrow and it's pointing to where swifts fall out on this family tree. It's interesting to see that they are next to uh, the line that says Topaza and Archilochus. Archilochus is the genus of ruby-throated hummingbirds. So in other words, swifts and their nearest relatives are hummingbirds. And then up from that, their next relatives are, the, are some night birds. We know of them as whippoorwill or the nighthawk. And so that little, that little clade of, of those branches on that tree, now we know a little bit more about who's related to whom. Um, when you see, if you go up the tree, you're actually going back in time. The, the red branches are with some waterfowl and, and chickens and their relatives. And then above that are the ostriches. So uh, swifts diverged from the avian, along the avian family tree pretty early on. And there are a variety of them. In the east, here, where, here we are in the east, we have one, the chimney swift. Uh, in North America, there are four species, but around the world, there are 70 to 80. Some folks you know, disagree about what a species is and, and which ones are actually full species or subspecies, but 
you can say 75, for example, and they're on every continent except uh, Antarctica. So it's uh, a lot of them are in tropics, whether you're in tropical South America or in uh, Africa or Southeast Asia. Here's what a few look like. Here's some of the variety of uh, going from large, medium, <clears throat> and uh, small. At the bottom, that small one is called a swiftlet. They're found in Southeast Asia and the Philippines in that region. In the middle is our chimney swift, for size reference. It's about a 20 to 25 gram bird, which is like two thirds of an ounce. And it's, it's around the, the total length of that body. There's you know, four to five inches, the wings extending beyond. And then above it is a huge species of swift. That thing is 150 grams. It's like a morning dove. So there's quite a bit of variety. I'll come back to the, near the end to talk about that little guy. <clears throat> so let's take a little closer look at uh, the chimney swift, which is the one that breeds here. They are a, they're a flying machine. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of wing and a stubby little body. And in fact, a lot of bird watchers, when we're out watching and we learn chimney swift, we often learn it by its, its moniker, calling it a flying cigar. It's got it's just that little cigar-shaped body with wings on it. And I wanted to take a look at the, a little bit closer at the wing. Um, I don't know if you can see the cursor or not, but I'm pointing to flight feathers on the bird, the outer, these are the primaries. This, this bird has 10, so if we count back 10, we get to right in here, and all these feathers go over to here on the bird's wrist. And then we have some other feathers here at six or seven that are secondary feathers. They go into the bird's forearm. And then up here is the, the humerus, upper arm, so to speak, and it's very short. So we can look at the bone here, a diagram of the bones. It's interesting. So the, the lower diagram of bone is a red, so that's a bird you would know, a robin, for example, blue jay. But compare the structure. So the humerus of the swift, this upper one, I mentioned how short it is. Here it's pretty abbreviated. And then here, so here on a songbird, twice as long proportionally. And then the, the radius on a bone, it's like our forearm between our elbow and wrist. So it's also a little bit shorter on a swift. And then when you get to the hand bones, remember I, I said that's where the primary flight feathers join. The hand bones are twice as long as on other birds. So these are the finger bones in a bird. They're fused. And <clears throat> you can see it's quite a difference from a, a, what we consider a, you know, a normal bird. Um, and so again, this, this is a bird built for flight. It's a strong flyer. The, that wing is rigid. And the, the shape of the wing is very aerodynamic. It's what we call a high aspect ratio. It needs a little power input. It's either input from the bird or say a headwind. <clears throat> and one thing I like to point out is that in horizontal flight, uh, there's a species of swift in Europe, the European swift, it's a little bigger than a chimney swift, but they've been clocked at up to 70 miles an hour in horizontal flight. And that's actually the fastest flight recorded for a bird under its own power. Now we talk about peregrine falcons all the time and being the speed uh, you know, demon and record holder, but that's when the bird is diving and has gravity to help it out. But in horizontal flight, the swifts are actually the, the champion flyers. Um, so here's um, what they would have done in the old days. There weren't always chimneys around, right? There were, there were hollow trees. This is a, a, a exhibit we did <clears throat> showing what they would have done if they were in a tree. Uh, you'll notice the tail. It's a little, a little different, a little bit spiny there. And um, you might wonder how they do that with their feet. They're not quite like a woodpecker, but in a way they are. So we'll take a look at their feet here. They have pretty, pretty small legs uh, here and small feet compared to other birds their size. <clears throat> they have three toes pointing forward, so no big deal. I mean, songbirds do that and songbirds have this hind claw where they grip the branch. What a swift can do that a songbird cannot do is they can rotate this hind claw forward like, a, like an opposable thumb. So they, and that's um, how they perch when folks have videoed them or taken photos of them inside the uh, chimney. They often have this one rotated forward, so they have all four pointing forward so they can get a better grip. Another thing that helps them out <clears throat> is, um, well, I'll mention, oh yeah, the uh, apodity means without feet. 
they their feet were so short that um, early on naturalists when they named the family they because the, hummingbirds have really small feet too and they put them all in the same family. Um, there's the tail up close. So uh, again, looking at the scientific name, it's kind of fun to see uh, the Kaitura. It's actually uh, derived from Greek and it means spine-tailed. Uh, what you have here is the, the feather venation on the sides of the central rachis. It just, it doesn't grow all the way to the tip. So it leaves the rachis sticking out and that tail can be used, the tail tips can be used for a, a propping when it's inside a chimney. These birds can only perch in a vertical fashion. They cannot perch horizontally. So what do they do? Uh, I mean, with they're built for flight, <clears throat> what do you do when you're flying around? Well, if you're a chimney swift, you pretty much do everything. So they feed on the wing. Once they leave a, a chimney or a tree, they're out all day feeding while they're flying. But they also do their courtship. Uh, they have a courtship flight they do on the wing. They, they've been known to nap. They, they've been studying the European swifts and um, can put accelerometer devices on them like a Fitbit type thing and discover that they can sleep on the wing. They break little twigs off of trees while they're flying around, the female does, and they can dip water uh, off ponds and, and lakes to get, a, uh, to get a drink or to take a bath. So it's almost everything. So they nest here, as I mentioned. Let's take a quick look. Their distribution here is east of the Rockies. The difference in red is just some of the numbers that we've uh, compiled since the mid 60s about their densities in different parts of the Eastern US. <clears throat> um, I mentioned that this was a big deal for a chimney swift because uh, historically they would have nested in trees and it's pretty difficult, a big hollow dead tree, it's pretty hard to find a big hollow dead tree in the east anymore. So it was fortuitous for whichever, you know, birds did this early on to find <clears throat> that they could do just fine inside of this cabin chimney. And then that's changed things quite a bit. It's interesting that here, one of the early naturalists and artists, John Catesby, also drew a chimney swift inside of a, an early brick well so that's interesting, and, and his, the timing of this is uh, during his lifetime. We're not sure exactly when the painting was done, but it would have been done after the um, birds in Maine were already using that, that chimney. So apparently something about this behavior uh, spread through the species and through the individuals started adopting these structures pretty early on. So it's been going on quite a while. And then probably made a big difference in um, in numbers during the industrial revolution. So we started building more and more chimneys, of course, and we don't have a lot of data on chimney swift numbers from the 17, 1800s. We didn't, again, we didn't really start doing those types of surveys until the 1960s, but <clears throat> surely by building all these chimneys around the East, uh, we, we probably helped provide a, a habitat for these birds and they adopted chimneys to great extent. Back in, back in those days, they, they sometimes refer to them as a hollow tree swift or just the tree swift. Sometimes they called them the um, chimney swallow. They are not swallows. A purple martin is a swallow, barn swallow, of course. Um, but as you saw in that family tree, this is a, these birds are uh, very di distantly related to a swallow. In the non-breeding season, they head to South America and so they're, they're roosting right now in these big flocks. It's part of their behavior. And I'll show some video at the end. They are they gather in these big flocks as part of their pre-migration strategy. So we're up here. We do know that the birds fly through Central America. Ornithologists working in these countries have uh, documented the birds flying through. They come down here. Um, what I'm pointing out here is that Historically, we drew the range here because some site records or possible site records, it's hard to tell chimney swift from some of the species that are resident in this part of South America. There, there are several that look alike. Um, and it's only been in the last probably 20 years that some of the local ornithologists have begun to figure out how to tell them apart while they're flying around, zipping around in the sky. But we really only have a little bit of data that confirms that they're going to this little small region. Uh, but now, of course, with new tracking devices, we will, uh, it won't be long before we'll, we'll know more. But, um, but I'll talk a little bit about that too at the end. Here's what a nest looks like. So on the inside, they, it just needs to be a, the, a half moon shape. A female lays the eggs. It's a stick nest. 
You may wonder how does she uh, put that together? It's with saliva. So it's one nest per chimney. And again, they're gonna, they're, when they're done, they change their behavior and become very social. <clears throat> Here's the uh, nest from below out at Prairie Ridge. We have that tower built and they've nested in it. So you can see how loosely put together the sticks are like pickup sticks. You can see the eggs through the bottom. So as I mentioned, um, she, she uses saliva. She'll start putting the twigs here on the surface complete the nest, lay four to five eggs, sometimes six or seven, and then incubates for three weeks. So it's a saliva um, that she uses her own to glue the twigs together. And I'm gonna come back now to this bird. I said, I wanted to mention this bird again, this Southeast Asian bird. Um, this little guy <clears throat> is a species that when, when she builds the nest, it's all saliva. And they nest on cliff walls and in cave walls and many, many, many years ago, somebody figured out you could take the nest. It's, again, it's all saliva. She'll lay down a layer of saliva, let it harden, and then lay more and more until she's got a nest. Somebody figured out you could dissolve it. Maybe they uh, heat it a little bit, but they make soup out of it. And that's bird's nest soup. And it's, uh, you know, for many people, it's a real delicacy <clears throat> and it's an expensive thing. So there was a lot of pressure to collect these nests for many years and make some money and then you know they figured out well they need to have more swifts if they're going to have nests so they also figured out they could build these big rock walls and the swifts were attracted to them just like building a birdhouse but uh, they come and they have the, so people can have their own flock of swifts and they'll let the female build her first nest they'll collect the first nest and then let her build a second nest and she'll raise young from that one and then everybody's happy they got their birds nest soup and the swifts have more baby swifts so um, it's an interesting system. When the nestlings uh, <clears throat> are getting restless, <laughs> they will leave the nest at about two weeks, but they do not leave the chimney. They're not ready to go. It takes about a month for them to be ready to fly. But for, uh, for about two weeks, they will hang out outside the nest. So here's that nest in Prairie Ridge and these little siblings are hanging out outside. And what they do is they begin flapping, practicing. They build up their uh, breast muscles, they have very big breast muscles for flying. And because when they leave that chimney, they need to be ready to go. Again, they cannot perch horizontally. If, they hit, if that bird hits the ground, it's not gonna be able to get back up. So they gotta be ready. So they spend a couple of weeks practicing. They, they will fly up and down several feet inside the chimney practicing uh, for a couple of weeks before they're ready to go. And when, they're, when they are, when they are uh, still inside the chimney, the, the family, these guys, they do hang out together. Typically when the people do video work or I've gone in to check on them a few times, they're always together like this. So what about the roost? Because that's what's going on now. <clears throat> well, I mentioned it's been going on a while. <clears throat> um, Here's a, a story that uh, we got from John James Audubon in Louisville, 1808. He found a tree where he estimated 9,000 swifts in this uh, large sycamore tree. Um, I like the way he writes, the evening was beautiful. Thousands of swallows were flying above me, three or four at a time pitching in to the hole of a hollow branch. So, you know, that was a hole in the side of a tree. So it's interesting that they um, also adapted to chimneys where the hole is facing up. The European swifts also go into the side. And so they make their, uh, they do some modifications to roofs on some of the houses over there to accommodate the European swifts, <clears throat> but it's on the side. I hear the shot that a colleague took over on NC State campus. It's kind of cool, even though it's with their smartphone, it shows you what it looks like when you're down on the ground at a chimney waiting for the birds to come in. So they, they start showing up at a, their chosen chimney site maybe 20, 10, 20 minutes before sunset and they'll be circling around. You can see it's a donut shape and they don't necessarily fly in, in the same direction. They'll fly in one direction for a while, might be counterclockwise. And then somebody decides, we don't know how this works. They, uh, they will change direction, almost invert like a figure eight and then start going in the other direction. And they do this for 20 minutes or so. They, they really won't begin going into the chimney until about 15 minutes after sunset during civil twilight. Um, you know, it changes a little bit uh, day to day or flock to flock. <clears throat> That's sort of the general way it works. So again, when they're not nesting, they're very social. 
And so what they're doing is they're sleeping in this chimney overnight. Uh, some people get confused. They see them all going in at night and they think there's a bunch of bats going in. Of course, if there were bats, they'd be coming out. Um, but anyway, we call this the staging behavior. Here's a couple of chimneys tops that I took a photo when I was on top of one of the buildings downtown, but you can see it's got this little concrete rim that makes it even smaller. Uh, you know, for, for years, we just thought that the chimney was as big as the base of the chimney. But then I went up and noticed that there are these rims that were put on. So it's a pretty small opening. And there's one over here. And it, it just baffles me that if you're a bird flying several hundred feet above and you're looking down and, you know, who decided that that was a good idea <laughs> to investigate? But of course, if you're used to flying inside of a small size hole in the side of a tree, then I guess this looked like the real Mecca to these birds. But um, anyway, it gives us some insight into, <clears throat> into what they're up against. And that's just a view from on top of one of the buildings looking out. And again, it's been going on a while. This fellow, John Burroughs, one of the early writers, uh, was watching a flock. He estimated 10,000 swifts at a 55-foot chimney. So that's back in 1905. Um, and again, here's you know just a shot of some birds going in. <clears throat> so how, how do they enter? We get this question a lot because we all thought they just would dive in, dive in, or early on they did. And they don't. They finally had some high-speed uh, photography, flash photography done back in the 1920s and figured out that what the bird does is it uh, slows down and then it spreads the tail and it pulls up. So it's, it's dropping in when at all possible. And, and we've seen, we've looked closely now and seen a lot of them. And uh, whenever possible, they drop in tail first. And a lot of times they end up spinning a bit like a maple seed that you see falling in the spring. Um, and uh, it happens so quickly, though, unless you take some video and slow it down, it's hard to see. Whoops. So again, some of the, our colleagues have noted that <clears throat> these birds fly through Central America. Uh, apparently, some will go over the Gulf through the Caribbean islands into South America, but a lot of them seem to go through Central America on and down into South America. And then I mentioned that um, there was that blob over here in South America. And, I'm zooming in here because what our colleagues in <clears throat> Peru have told us is that they see the chimney swifts, and I, I'm, you know, tongue in cheek on the gypsy swift. <laughs> they see the chimney swifts show up on the West Coast in, say, late October, November, and the birds will spend a couple months and then they're gone, so they don't stay. And um, but they do, but but we do know that some swifts are over here. So apparently these swifts, we're not sure about. Apparently they're flying over the Andes, um, and most of the most of the Andes through central Peru are pretty high. Um, there are some low passes at say nine or 10,000 feet. That's still pretty high. Um, so these birds are, 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 are really, really flight oriented. They head over this way. And then we, we really only have this one record of some birds that were tagged in the US in the 1940s and were discovered over here um, the next, like the next year. Uh, it was kind of an accident. Some indigenous folks were built a fire at the base of a tree to smoke out whatever animals they could because they were looking for something to eat. And uh, some Jesuit priests were working in the area. And what fell out were a dozen chimney swifts and some of them had these little bracelets on their feet. And those are the, those are the rings or the bands we put on birds that were studying them. And lo and behold, the Jesuits knew what to do and they shipped them off to the bird banding lab in Texas, Maryland. And it was an amazing thing. Um, we've not had anything like that happen since, but now there are new tracking devices and you, know, you can put a tracking device on a bird and uh, you get it. You have to get the device back. They're data loggers, but they've done that with different species of swifts, not chimney swift yet, but other species and get the data back. And it gives you a flight path of, of where the bird, how it flew and, and where it went for the non-breeding season. But the best we know, it's here, like Eastern Peru, Western Brazil, maybe Eastern Colombia. Um, we're still learning. And this just shows the trend. Why do we care? Uh, it's because in a lot of places where you see the red, the birds have been declining since the 60s. Again, it may be because we built up all their numbers with the Industrial Revolution, but we've also had a lot of trees, big hollow trees that are no longer on the landscape. So there's some real, just always some challenges. And so they are in decline. And so we're just trying to get the word out and encourage people to, you know, if you can keep a chimney open for them, if you have one that they can nest in. Another colleague did a study in the Piedmont region of home construction and learned that about 1995, new home construction, either they didn't have chimneys or if they did, the, the construction was different 
and the lining is smooth on the inside so the birds can't perch. Um, so the Wake Audubon, again, I, uh, on the board and John and I worked with the, the whole membership and the museum, we did a big fundraiser and we uh, got money to build a chimney out of Prairie Ridge. Again, they don't have roosting birds, um, but they do have nesting birds in the spring and summer. We've had about 10 babies fledge from the chimney, but we raised a lot of money to get the tower built and we've been doing a, a lot of outreach over the last uh, 20 years and a lot of surveys around Wake County. I'm gonna, uh, wait, I wanna show this one first. This is about a 30 second video. This is downtown Raleigh, the professional building next to the News and Observer. And it's just my point and shoot camera. So a lot of birds will fly past while other birds drop in. It's one of these uh, behavioral things that uh, you know, we don't, we, we presume it is just a way to fool any would be predator. But um, you can see it's, uh, the sun is set. It's after, well after sunset. Now that was one. This is one of my favorites. It's a little longer, it's two videos put together. I'm on top of the building. And you can see how the flock is, you know, circling me. I'm I'm very close to the chimney. It reminds me of the Wizard of Oz and the flying monkeys coming in. The sun is set. It can be a little disorienting to be uh, zoomed in so close, but it looks like they're diving in. It's hard to imagine that they're pulling up. Although there are times when uh, I can tell that they are. They're pulling up and going in tail first when I, I've been able to slow. There was one there, you could see it pretty well, but I did do some, I did slow it down at one point to double check and a bunch of them do pull up right at the end and go in tail first. It's interesting that there's so much daylight in the sky and and that they're plunging into this pretty dark interior and they, they don't roost within the first two or three feet of the top. So their eyes, you know, they have some really interesting physiology. I don't, we don't know exactly how it works yet, but they're able to accommodate this shift from some light to dark. And then right next to um, the News and Observer, and this uh, was across the street from where I just was, is um, that professional building again. There's a little more wind this evening. And so the birds aren't having to uh, come in so steep. They're facing into the wind. They're facing east It's, a, it's an unusual, time for wind to come out of the east that night, um, but there they are, they're facing east and they're dropping in. It's even darker now. <clears throat> they, they do this with minimal collision or contact with one another, which is a pr another pretty interesting thing. Um, and in fact, so interesting that <clears throat> the Department of Defense funded some researchers at UNC Chapel Hill a few years ago who came to downtown right they, they they emailed me to say we need we need to photograph we need to video some chimney swifts and a lot of them and i said well we have them <clears throat> and at the time they didn't have any uh, roost flocks in chapel hill so they came to raleigh these three students were working with dr hedrick in his lab he studies bird and a moth flight mechanics and they came and did all this incredible video and i mean they just got terabytes and terabytes of data they were being funded by the department of defense because the department was interested in how these birds were doing what they do without colliding. And they were looking to see if they could maybe model their drone, drone mechanic and drone behavior to have a flock of drones be used and not collide with one another. So I thought that's, you know, we often turn to nature for solutions to uh, our own problems and challenges. So anyway, um, this is just a little video in case you're wondering what the birds do when they're in a chimney at night. Um, they line up right there on the mortar, but they also, they're preening and they, they're moving around a bit. Uh, some flying around, they bump their buddy off. You can see the one comes up and it's like, yeah, I, I think I wanna sit there, I wanna perch there. Uh, this is, again, this is just a, a, a short video and, uh, but the, it was a crew from National Geographic that did this. There was a show they were producing on things that are nocturnal things that sometimes get in your house at night and they wanted to feature chimney swift a little bit. So they dropped the camera down that chimney and uh, 
Anyway, it's kind of interesting to see how much activity goes on inside of a chimney at night. The birds are not just sleeping. Um, see, I think that's that's enough of that. <laughs> and that's um, so that's it. So long again, long ago, the chimney swift. Uh, adopted a chimney and tied their future to us. We're st it's still going on, it's still a story. And uh, we as uh, humans are interacting with them quite a bit. It's become quite the urban bird. And uh, there are some continued challenges that hopefully we'll be able to uh, do things that we can to help with the conservation of chimney swifts. And with that, Chris, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, John, thank you very much such cool birds uh you such cool birds that they're even becoming these like a uh, little pop culture gatherings around town like i think i've seen in durham and in raleigh where like rooftop bars throw parties <laughs> <laughs> to come and watch chimney swiss because you can see out over the city and watch them come into roost normally we do this we do this as a live program and john and i <clears throat> along with some other uh, wake audubon board members have been leading what we call a chimney swift walk or watch uh, for the last five years we would do every sunday in september and we give this program first out in front of the big globe there at the nature research center we'd meet at the <clears throat> nature research center outside there's there's benches there People bring mm -hmm. chairs, they bring, a, they bring a picnic dinner. We would talk for 40 minutes or so and then walk down toward the NNO where they typically are roosting and we'd then stand there for 30 more minutes and watch. And it became popular with a lot of people. There were nights we had uh, over a hundred people show up, which was, it was oh, nice wow. to have the News and Observer parking lot because it's open and plenty of room for a hundred people. And yes, there are, there are cities now all over the, not just the east, but out west, because the Vox of Swift, which is closely related to the Chimney Swift, does the same thing. And in fact, in Portland, Oregon, <clears throat> they've made it a big, big celebration event. There's a school there where they have been hosting Swifts for uh, at least 10 years, and they've made it a big thing. And the town comes out every fall. They have all, it's a big picnic, and it's like a festival. And of course, this year was a bummer because they, they couldn't do it uh, in person they had to have to do it virtually like we're doing but for many years they've been doing these big parties essentially and and more and more so yeah out of out in durham and chapel hill and winston and charlotte there's a group there's a flock that uses the old grove hotel in Asheville. so people are really catching on and we 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 made a splash by building that chimney it was one of the it was the first time in the country anybody thought about building one for a chimney swift and we've mm -hmm. had uh, we've been con we've been doing consultations with people in four or five different states who are doing one and uh, folks in Canada. <clears throat> uh, so you know, borrowing plans from us and just talking about the process and that sort of thing. So it's been exciting to see the gospel of chimney swift spreading throughout the land. <laughs> <laughs> if you build a chimney, they will come. <laughs> and they've come to the nest, you know, they haven't come to roost. Mm -hmm. They are so tied to their sense of you know, place apparently. They fly over Prairie Ridge every night on their way. Uh, there's some over at, across the street at the National Guard, small chimneys. There are still some downtown. There are some schools still have them. And uh, we've done some audio luring playback of their call and it, it actually works. It'll get them to come in, but only for that night. And if we don't keep doing it, they don't keep coming. But <clears throat> that's one of their social things we, we don't understand. There's a lot to be learned about the bird. We have been losing some chimneys little by little to urban renewal. And uh, so it, it's only a matter of time before all of a sudden our chimney becomes yeah, the oasis. But I mean, that's really interesting to, to think about is that chimney swifts used to use trees. We got rid of the trees, but at least in the Eastern US, right? And then we yeah. replaced them with chimneys. And now the birds are like, wow, we'll just use the chimneys. But now we're getting rid of the chimneys too. <clears throat> yeah, we never would have thought that something like urban renewal and new home construction techniques would cause a quote habitat loss, but, but it has. And so, yeah, we're just, you know, again, encouraging folks to, you know, if they, if they can accommodate a Swift. Also, we've worked with a couple of building managers 
to try to save chimneys. And there was one downtown, the transfer food hall folks, they did a renewal of that building complex to open up the food court. And they had an old chimney that the birds were using. It's a small flock, but John worked with them and they were all into having the birds there as an attraction, like you were saying. And it's right next to the outdoor patio. And uh, so this is the first year that that's been open. The birds are still around. They seem a little timid because there are, uh, you know, there's some outdoor seating with social distancing and there's a few people around, but they have been coming back to the chimney. But, um, you know, it's a little timid, but we're, you know, again, we're going to do the audio luring too to let them know or let them think it's okay. And, um, but it was really nice working with those building owners and they built the building around the chimney so that they could accommodate the birds. <clears throat> Excellent. That's that's cool to know. People are people are thinking about it. Yeah. At least around here. All right. Uh, let me go to the chat box. I'll remind everybody that if you've got questions or comments for us, you can drop them into the chat box. I think it's on that side, and uh, we'll pose those to John. So the first one that I've got for you, Hank wants to know: Is there a minimum height and diameter for a nest to be off the ground? So. Oh. When they nest in the chimney, uh, all the nests, most of the nests that we <clears throat> have information on is household chimneys. And what's interesting is they come down really low. They nest just above that flue. There's the, there's the, um, <clears throat> there's the ledge right above your flue. Mm -hmm. They tend to come down close to that ledge and I, you know, for the longest time, I just assumed that they were going to nest up kind of high and they'd want to get out, but they don't. She comes down pretty far. So now when there were these, there's this couple in Texas, they're retired now. They ran a toy store, <clears throat> but they really got into Swiss 30 years ago. They're in East Texas, so they, they're on the west edge of the Chimney Swift breeding range and they wanted to learn all about the bird. You know, classic, like classic citizen science stuff way back before that was a term. They, they learned all they could and they started building different structures to try to figure out what would work. And so they are the gurus of uh, Chimney Swift and, and building boxes for them. They figured out you can build a wooden box that's about 12 feet tall. And they, they like doing things like hardy plank because it lasts longer and only needs to be a foot, foot and a half diameter and the birds will nest in it. They will come down and nest. They also figure out if you go up to like 15 or 16 feet and make it two feet or three feet, you can have a flock come in. You'll get a flock in the fall, like two or 300 birds will use it, which is great because we don't necessarily need to have birds like several thousand. You know, we did this, we did this virtual watch last night mm -hmm. at one of the schools here in Raleigh at the uh, Oberlin Magnet School. And they've got about 2000 birds right now using their chimney. I, I first surveyed over there 20 years ago and they were using that chimney and, uh, but you don't, you know, it's great to have a chimney for 2000 birds, but you don't have to. And that's what the, this couple showed is you could have uh, a more affordable series of chimneys, for example. And uh, so for that's for roosting, but again, for nesting, they come down pretty low. So you could literally reach up through your flu and, and grab the bird on her nest. In many cases, she's that low. <clears throat> oh, wow. Wow. Okay, so uh, that poses a question for me. If the birds are in <clears throat> chimneys, like I get people probably aren't starting fires or furnaces in September in North Carolina, but what about some of these other places that are getting colder, especially at night right now? So I'd have to look and see the actual data, which they now have it uh, digitized, uh, especially the eBird data. You know, they've got uh, all this information online, it shows you the dates and some of it's even animated where you can see with an animated uh, map where the birds are at what time. And a lot of the birds up north have left. So our flocks, uh, surely our flocks are <clears throat> in flux. They uh, start off as local birds, but then there's an influx of birds from up north. And then probably some of the birds here leave and head south and then other birds join in from the north. And so that is a point. But, you know, in talking to people around the country, uh, we were only aware of that happening once or twice where a birds were in a, in a chimney where they fired up the furnace and 
uh, I think it, at least in one case, it did kill a bunch of birds, but in the other case, I think it scared them off. So it, it doesn't seem to happen much because of the way the birds are migrating. They're out of, they're out of harm's way just before, just before the uh, f fires get going or the furnaces get going. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good yeah. to know. They're okay. They're, They're generally okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Robert's got a question here. Do you have a count of how many chimneys that are being used in Raleigh and roughly how many swifts roost in Raleigh? We don't. We had, um, you know, it was just volunteer effort over the years and we just told people to go ahead and uh, we picked some chimneys for people to go check because uh, I mean, we would, we'd accumulated some information, just general observations years ago. And then, you know, told people just go drive around because uh, in the evening you can watch the birds and you can kind of see where they're going. <clears throat> and, uh, but, you know, we, we generally only have 10 or 12 people in any one season driving around checking on things. And it's not every night during the month of September. So, um, we don't know, we don't know all the chimneys that are being used and, uh, but when we get somebody letting us know, then we're, we're keeping tabs in a spreadsheet. Um, at one point, for example, we had 30 schools in Wake County, uh, but after the HVAC renovation bond, uh, they, they, apparently they did change like the lining or took some offline and they were no longer good for the swifts and so now it's just about the 10 that we monitor but there are probably others we just never have checked that that have them <clears throat> oh wow yeah it would be fun to All know right. every now and then we'll get a you know i've drive i was driving down the road a few years ago and uh right here out by the fairground and there the there's a little company out there that has a little chimney and i just happened to be there at the right time and noticed birds going in so i went back the next night and and they had like 400 swifts using their little chimneys. So there's probably a lot of that that goes on that we don't know about. <clears throat> just little chimneys all over the place. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's just as good as a big one. If we got a bunch of little ones, you know, as long as it's accommodating the birds. Yeah. So, so as they move through the Eastern U S they're using chimneys. Uh, what's the prevalence of chimneys through Central America and into South America for them to use? Like if they're moving we, into the Andes, yeah, it seems well, like they're not using a lot of chimneys, perhaps. No, and they probably trees? fly when they're in the mountain. I mean, they probably don't stay in the mountains. They just go th over them and down the other side. They probably do that in one day. Um, but when they're flying through Central America, they're on the Caribbean uh, slope down low. But there aren't a lot of chimneys there. Um, there would be in some of the larger cities. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. But honestly, I haven't talked to any, any of them but in those countries to know what they're, they're doing. And then sure, if you're in Western, if you're in Lima, Peru, you're gonna find some chimneys, but there are lots of other places where there are no chimneys. So they're still, they're still finding other trees, I guess. And maybe they do other things that we don't know. Maybe they perch outside uh, sometimes. There are probably things like that that we don't, we don't understand yet. Um, and over on the Amazon side, there's still enough big trees, I guess, for them to use. Um, but of course those are, being cut more and more as well. So Caroline wants to know, when chimney swifts sleep on the wing, how common are collisions, especially with urban populations around skyscrapers? Well, the only work <clears throat> that's been done that I'm aware of is over with the European one. And I think it's a fairly recent thing that they've decided that these birds are sleeping on the wing. And so we have no, we don't really have any other information about it uh, some information that's come about uh, recently physiological information is that the birds are not actually in a full sleep when they do it it's sort of like half brain they're they're closing one eye or they're shutting down only part of the brain and uh i gotta tell you the day we can figure out how to do that we're <laughs> wow. we're, we're off and running it's going to be awesome right you just, yeah, you close one eye for a couple hours and then shift over to the other, but you can keep doing stuff, I guess. So there's, uh, this is a fascinating new thing about, yeah, avian physiology that people are just starting to figure out. So Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if I trust half of the human brain shutting down one yeah. when we all commute to work in the morning. <laughs> right, which half. Yeah. Which half. 
So yeah, we I, don't I wouldn't know. trust it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Hank left a cool comment. If anyone is interested, uh, Dilworth Elementary School in Charlotte has chimney swifts. Oh, great. And they're in Mecklenburg and, Audubon, uh, usually host the program. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously not this year, but um, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Uh, and Hank was asking, uh, we have a chimney cap on our chimney. When should we remove it to allow for nesting? Yeah, that's great. You know, we, we've talked to a lot of folks about that. I will mention we did a, we had a, a grad student here at NC State that John and I were helping along with the professor over there. And she was doing what we call a human dimensions study, which was to learn about people's attitudes toward chimney swifts and just chimney and capping in general. And <clears throat> she found that um, most of the people she spoke to a thousand people, most of them were, were, were fine with the bird. They had capped their chimney because of other problems like raccoons and possums and even water damage and things like that. Um, and so some indicated they'd be interested in the uncapping maybe during the nesting season. We, we, we've thought about trying to come up with a, a design to do a side entrance. And then we, we started looking online and the Europeans have already done it. So it's like, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good to know. And, uh, you know, that may be the way to go where we get people to, they can have their cap and have their ch chimney swift as well. Uh, Cause the cap will keep out larger animals as well as water damage. So they come back in, in early April um mid-april and they don't really seem to get going till may so i think sometime like you could think of it as tax day that sort of thing and you could take the cap off and then then they're done they're done nesting around here most of the time by late july mm -hmm. some some linger into early august but by mid-august they're done and then they are going to form these <clears throat> little family groups that coalesce into like neighborhood groups and then the bigger groups, and then they shift to a different chimney. So usually by Labor Day, they're not in the in the household chimneys as much. You know, we get a few reports now, and then people say, "Oh, we got 20 birds in our chimney for you know like a, a early September roost, which is pretty cool." Um, but by and large, they're heading over to these other bigger flocks. <clears throat> and it brings up one other you know uh, question that we get a lot is the noise. So the babies are noisy, and your chimney is an echo chamber. And it's, yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a little speaker amplifier and it sends noise when the babies are like two weeks old and start begging. If you've got four baby swifts, it is so loud. It's a rattle. They make this rattling sound like somebody's got several, you know, pebbles they're clicking together. And <clears throat> it's really, it's really something to hear. Uh, but what you can do is you can prop up some foam, either styrofoam or just, you know, soft foam, like your pillow and prop it up at the flue at the entrance there. And, uh, you know, it's probably a good idea to like hang a, a, an old sock or something down so it reminds you that it's there or use a stick to hold it up that reminds you that it's there. And, and then in the fall, you take that down or when they're done, you can take that down. It will block 90% of that noise. You, you really won't hear the noise. And if a bird falls into your chimney, they're pretty hardy. They're really tough birds. If it's the adult, you can just gently, you can throw something over it and pick it up, but you can just hold it your, uh, with your fingers over the birds, you know, back over the shoulders and just reach up inside and put its feet right on the wall, like Velcro, just stick it to the wall. It, it'll grab, it'll grab the brick. The minute you let go, it'll just fly up and out. I've done that a few times. Um, if it's a baby, you can usually reach up or get a light and look up and see where the nest is and just put it back in or if it's a big baby it'll just you just again stick it like velcro to the wall and it'll climb back up oh wow all right uh let's see looks like this one might be the last one penelope wants to know do both parents care for the young they both <clears throat> provide they do both provide the females doing the incubation and uh, she'll leave periodically during the incubation you know during the period during the day she'll make several trips out to feed. I can't recall now if the male has ever been seen to provision the female. Often in songbirds, they do, but he will help provision the young. And then once they're out of the nest, they pretty much have to figure it out. They, they, um, they follow the adults around and figure out what to do. They bring, when they're bringing food back, 
they gather up quite a bit and it, they form a, a ball. It's like a little ball of insects and with a little bit of saliva mixed in that they bring for the young. A little pea side ball of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, John, thanks for jumping in tonight for you the bet. Science Cafe. It's really cool to learn a little bit about these birds. I'm going to have to find an opportunity to get downtown yeah. and, and look for them. Got to get out and see some. What, tell me again what, what some of these really good spots to, to go there's looking a, are. There's been a big flock over at the Broughton Hall chimney on the NC State campus. And um, there have been these birds at the uh, Oberlin Magnet Middle School. There are birds at Emlo. Carnage has a small flock. I think the DMV building on Newburn has had a decent flock of birds. And that's that's been a spot where they've been at for years as well. And um, those are the ones I can... And the, the birds are still downtown near the News and Observer. They're not using the chimney this year uh, because John had been going down to see, like, why aren't they using the chimney? And he discovered there's a peregrine falcon that's been flying around and apparently it chases them now and then. And so they are they are roosting somewhere nearby he just hasn't had a lot of time to figure out where but they're down there so. you know what i i said that was the last question and yep. i overlooked <clears throat> one all right uh because and, and i'm glad you said peregrine falcon because somebody wanted to know about natural predators well that's a good one you know we we presume that so they're going to roost at night the way they do they they go in after sunset any diurnal predator has gone to gone to bed and it's a little bit before some of the owls come out or the owls are right there at that at that moment between during civil twilight <clears throat> but um you know we don't see a lot of owls in the urban setting hunting quite yet in civil twilight but um but those birds it seems to be one way to avoid predators uh, we have seen Cooper's hawks, we've seen the falcon go by when they come in be right before sunset and they're flying around. Never seen a hawk uh, catch one, although uh, inevitably they would. It would likely, it would be a young one. You know, that's what young birds do. They don't know any better. And, um, <clears throat> and then while they're nesting, probably things can get in, but we really don't have a lot of data on what would get inside of a, of a chimney to, to mm -hmm. get to the eggs or the young because uh, there hasn't been a lot of nesting studies done, certainly not with uh, video cameras. So that's one of the things we'd like to do is over at Prairie Ridge, we have little portals in that chimney. Um, uh, we're ready to put a little wildlife camera in there to see what goes on because this year she tried to nest twice and both times something got the eggs or the young. And so we're not sure what went on because oh. we didn't see any signs of, <clears throat> of what could have gone on but we were thinking maybe a crow went down and uh and gone crows are pretty efficient predators um yeah sure but you know historically in a hollow tree there might have been the black rat snakes are very good climbers and they could have gone up and, and gotten some birds but you know other than that it's just some kind of rapid when they go to the tropics there are a lot of bird eating hawks and falcons that are in the forest and uh they are they're not necessarily common raptors they're all there are a lot of species but they're all kind of rare but they are able to they there's some that eat bats uh, uh they eat small birds and i'm sure every now and then they they get a swift but there are lots of other small birds for them to eat too so there's some safety in numbers so it's um that's the way it looks for for predation on, on chimney swift good question eric thank you yeah <clears throat> yeah and good answer, John. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight for this virtual science cafe. We will be back here next Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Check out naturalsciences.org to see what programs are coming up for the month of October, too. You can get the whole lineup there. we got some cool stuff going on. And if you don't want to have to just mark your calendar, there's a quick and easy way to make sure that you know what's going on. You can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel down below, and then you click the little bell icon, and then you'll get a notification every time we go live with a new video. So next Thursday, seven o'clock, you won't even have to remember, ping, there it is, and you can come join us and learn something new with experts from all over. 
Follow the museum on social media as well. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at Natural Sciences on all three platforms. And good news, the Museum of Natural Sciences has resumed operations. So you can go to the museum's website, naturalsciences.org slash open. And there you can get information on how to get free timed tickets to come and visit the museum. And you can read up on our changes in the hours of our operation and our safety protocols. Lots of good information there. And we're happy to welcome everybody back into the museum. So with that, I think uh, I'm going to end it right here on, I hope this works, on here's a video from the museum's YouTube channel that you could go watch of Chimney Swifts. And I hope that everybody has a great Thursday evening. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.